Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Joshua Giawea. I'm a senior front-end engineer at a company based out of Minneapolis called Code42. We developed a software called CrashPlan. I've been working there now for about two and a half years. I started my career about 12 years ago as an ActionScript developer. So if you guys remember the days of Flash, then you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you're probably better off for it. Um, <laughs> Um, so this talk today is uh, SVG versus everybody, and the reason I titled it that is because I think there's a lot of misconceptions around when we should be using SVGs and how we can be using SVGs. Um, so I just kind of want to pin it against the other HTML elements and methods to get raster images in our browser, and we can kind of take a look at the benefits of using SVG over those other methods. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the SVG. A benefit about the SVG, how I actually got introduced to SVGs was at work. A coworker of mine said, we need to use SVGs for this project. And I was totally against it because of how complicated I thought they were. But he said, no, they're really simple. Let me show you. And ever since then, I've been an SVG fanboy. So he, he turned me on to that. Um, I'm going to show you guys um, how to convert a PNG to SVG using Illustrator. Um, we're going to look at the anatomy of an SVG, what's actually in those SVG files. Um, and then we'll look at a couple real-world use cases. Um, so jumping right in, a brief history. It's been around for about 15 years now. Um, it was first introduced in 1999, and the first release candidate was in 2000. And here's the kicker, all current browsers currently support SVG, so there's no reason why you shouldn't be or couldn't be using it. Um, so why would we want to use an SVG over a raster image like a PNG or a JPEG? Um, I think one of the biggest reasons is control. Um, once you put that image in the browser, you no longer have control of it. I mean, you can make it responsive, kind of, but you can't really move elements around inside the image. You're kind of stuck with that image moving forward. So you can add styles in line in an SVG, or you can control them from your style sheet which is really powerful. Um, you can group elements inside of SVG, which is also really powerful. Um, way better accessibility. I have the ability to add accessibility to individual elements or group of elements inside my SVG. So that's really, really great. Uh, performance. So let's just take the use case of social share icons or social icons, right? If we have five of them, and we use the PNG method, we have to go and get five images from our server. Not ideal. We can use another method, which is we can load up a sprite and then tell via CSS where in that sprite that icon actually lives, but that's still one request. Um, if you use inline SVGs, zero requests. Reusable. There's this really nifty feature in SVG called use, meaning if I already have an SVG element on the page, I can just reference it inside of another SVG and get it for free. It actually doesn't load any more code, and what it actually does is creates that element within the shadow DOM. It's totally responsive. It's not this cover, contain situation where you kind of got to decide if you're going to go full with, with it or you know, condense it or stretch it out, you can actually move elements around inside of it. You can target individual elements inside the SVG or groups, which is really powerful. Uh, you can use media queries to target those individual elements or groups. Um, so this is kind of an example of that. Well, I guess not. <laughs> but, um, so basically, if you have a Walt Disney logo, let's just say, and you want to dwindle it down as the page gets smaller, um, you can kind of target each one of these elements. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in Illustrator. So this is kind of what that looks like in Illustrator. Um, you can layer it and group it out and name it. And when you save it out, um, Illustrator actually saves out the groups with your naming conventions from your Illustrator file. Accessibility. Um, again, we can we can target different elements or group of elements inside of SVG and give screen readers information about those individual elements. Filters. 
This is a really powerful feature in SVG. It allows you to define inline filters for your SVG and it's reusable. No need to do complex CSS when you're using these filters. It automatically does things like blur for you. So you don't have to write some convoluted CSS to achieve that. Animations. This is, for me, it harkens back to my Flash days, right? Like when we lived in the world of Flash, we had all these things flying all around. Sometimes these super long intros that you didn't want to watch, but they just gave them to you anyways. Um, but this gives you the power again to animate certain elements. Um, they have a built-in feature of animations and you can do things like within the SVG, target an element and move it to a different part of that viewport. And again, this is like, I think one of the most powerful features. I can target individual or groups of elements inside the SVG. So it's not just making the entire image responsive, it's making every element inside that SVG responsive. Using raster images like PNGs and JPEGs for things like customer logos. I think we got to do away with that um, for so many reasons. One, it's not future proof. You know, what Apple just came out with a 6K TV. What is, you know, what is your client's 200 by 200 logo look like on that TV? We don't even know, right? We don't, and we don't know how many Ks they're going to go up to. They could go up to 100 Ks. So, I mean, let's imagine a situation where our name is Christine and we're newly single and we're getting on this data app thing called Twitter. Or sorry, Tinder. <laughs> we're getting on this data app thing called Tinder. Now, would we, if we're Christine, put up a blurry or pixelized image of ourselves? in our dating profile. I don't think we would. I don't think we'd go with this, right? We wouldn't say, this works for me. And if you wouldn't put yourself or your image in this light, you probably shouldn't do it for clients either because their logo is very dear to them. Their brand is very dear to them. Okay, so how do we get from this pixelated PNG to this crispy, clear SVG? And now I'm gonna do a live demo, which I hope goes well. We're gonna find out. Um, just give me one second to set it up here. Okay, cool. So I'm an illustrator and I have a WordPress logo PNG. Okay, I'm gonna load it up and here it is. So actually, Illustrator makes this super easy for you. Right here um, at this top navigation bar, you can do a thing called trace image. Trace image needs a little bit of information from you as a user. It just kind of wants to know how complex is this image before I convert it. So this image is not very complex at all. Um, sometimes I'll just go with three colors, even if it's one, just because that means that you're going to optimize it a little better. So let's do that. And do its thing. Okay. Now, as soon as we click expand, we're done. We got it. It's an SVG. And they've already grouped it for us, and they've already broken it down in the past for us. And we can go in here and group them differently and name them differently if we want. So when we save out the SVG, we have the naming conventions we want. Um, so if the customer gives you a logo and it's not an SVG, you can convert it in a matter of seconds, right? I mean, that was super painless. Um, sometimes it gets a little more tricky when the logos are a little bit more complex um, or the images are a little smaller, but you know, as you kind of go along, you'll learn different uh, tricks and tactics to mitigate that. Yep. Yeah, I think if there is, uh, okay, so here it is right here. I think you can, oh. So I don't, this already has a transparent background, I think. I think it's just white because the artboard is white. So it's already transparent, but if, yes, if that were to happen and there was a white background on it, um, you could just click into that layer and delete it. That's fine. There is actually a way of, like, depending on how you're doing it, 
Oh. Um, there's a checkbox, so I don't know. Oh, cool. Um, so then we can just save this out here. Um, we can just save it as an SVG. And voila, we're done. We can just take a look at the code right in here. Um, and, you know, Illustrator does a really good job of grouping things and then automatically appending classes to the different paths. And you see those classes represented up there in the style tag. If you're familiar with HTML and CSS, that should be something that you're pretty much used to. Um, is there any other questions about how to convert a PNG to SVG before we move on? What's that? I know, uh, no, no. With the photo? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I think you kind of got to delineate between is this a good candidate for an SVG or not. Uh, to me, most good candidates for an SVG are things like icons and logos. Images, although you can do it, and you can do it well, uh, most images, they just don't work, they're too complex. Yeah? Um, do you have any advice on optimizing, like if you have a more, because a lot of times I've, I've not done like crazy complex stuff, but Illustrator's giving me like big SVGs, mm -hmm. you know, and um, mm -hmm. I, know there, I know there used to be like all the optimizers and stuff, but yeah. do you have any preferences on stuff like that? What, what do you mean, optimizing for readability of code or optimizing for performance? For performance, just, just, to, just to kind of, because a lot of times Illustrator will add, I mean, it depends on how good the trace is, right. I guess, but a lot of times it seems like Illustrator adds a lot of, a lot of extra points and stuff. Yep. Yep. Put that through a compressor. Yeah. Yep. There's a there's a plugin. I think it's called SVG Go. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We use SVG Go, and we we just built that into our gulp task, so that just happens for us automatically when we run our build. Um, another thing you can do is get rid of unneeded layers, right? You can kind of optimize it yourself in this interface if you like. I like to go in and group layers based on the colors they may or may not be. Cool. All right. So now we know how to create an SVG, how do we actually use it? Um, so there's three different types of SVGs or three different ways that you can basically use an SVG in your code to get it to display in a browser. That's object mode. Object mode is kind of like an iframe or a video embed. Um, there's image mode. Image mode is just like um, any image tag or background image in your CSS where you would load an image in. And then there's inline. Inline is going to give you the most flexibility and benefits, and that's pretty much exclusively really what we use at Code42. So let's take a look at each one of those. If you're familiar with HTML, I mean, this is pretty basic. Um, and you can load it in via image tag or background in your styles. Um, and then this is just an SVG tag. This is just a basic SVG tag, just like any other HTML element, like div or... Yep, just, just right there in your HTML, you can just define it, and that's the easy part. Uh, what are the advantages of using an inline SVG? We've already covered a lot of them, but one of the big advantages is it solves an age-old problem, which is make the logo bigger, <laughs> right? Everyone wants you to make the logo bigger. Well, in the past, if I was going to make the logo bigger, I would have to open up Photoshop, recrop my canvas, recrop my image, save it back out, load it back up to the server. Voila, it's bigger. You owe me for one hour of work, sir. Just kidding. Um, now you could just apply CSS classes and make it bigger 
right there, right then. You can do it in the browser form or just using CSS, you can make it bigger. All right, so we've already talked about some of these, but let's go over it again. What are the advantages? All right, we got crisp on any screen resolution. If they come out with a 10K TV, you're sure it's gonna look good. Less HTTP requests to no HTTP requests, which is just amazing. <coughs> Easy to animate. It is extremely easy to animate SVGs. You can, yes? Are, are you creating the animation uh, in Illustrator? No. Nope. Um, but I, I am going to talk about how the different various ways you can animate SVG. Um, easy to make accessible. Well supported. Yep. You go, when it comes to accessibility, how, I do accessibility more work at how. Yep, I'm going I'm to get into the how in a little bit. Um, controlled with styles. Now, how many of you currently use SVGs? Cool. How many of you guys currently use SVGs but have never opened up SVG file and actually looked at what the output is? <laughs> okay, we got a couple. Cool. Well, this is what the inside of an SVG file looks like. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it is, it is kind of scary. Um, so this is typically what the inside of our SVG files at Code42 looks like. Um, so we define our styles up top, and we give it um, a class definition, and then we just define our classes in our two paths. Can anyone, by looking at this example code, tell me what this is going to render? You got it. So that code renders this. Um, and the reason why we've kind of broken them up into two classes and defined them up there is one of the paths needs to be red and one of them needs to be almost black. Cool. All right. We know how to convert an SVG. We know what an SVG looks like. We know how to apply styles to an SVG. But that doesn't really get us all the way there, right? We're all here for WordCamp. We're all here for WordPress. So how do we use SVGs in WordPress? Uh, is, is anybody in the room currently using SVGs in their theme production? How do you typically do it? Uh, well, I even within the custom template, using in line. OK. Uh, I've got some code that I've written in my functions file to be able to upload them in the media again. Okay, okay, cool, yep. So that's typically, um, typically the way people do it, just inline right there in their template or, um, or just upload it to the media gallery and then you can use image mode to pull it in. We use this nifty feature called uh, Git File Contents. So we want our SVGs to be inline, but we want to tell our template which SVD to load um, when it gets the request from the server. And the reason why we want to do that is we might have a template in which the SVG and the markup, they're all the same. But the difference is the SVG logo that we want to bring back. So I'll give you an example. I have a client that um, sells trade show booths and they have all these different product pages and all these different product templates are the same. Right? There's a slideshow to the left, information, and then you know, the product line logo. And so I want to reuse that template, but I need to grab a different logo for that template to represent the product line. So that's why we would do something like this. Um, there's also a plugin that you can use, SVG support. I haven't used this plugin, but they do support inline SVG, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, code 42 case study. So this is that moment in time where my coworker came to me and said, we gotta use SVGs for this product. We cannot use PNGs. I'm like, why? Why can't we use it? I know how to use PNGs. It's because we love our logos. We love to show off our clients at code 42. We have a lot of clients. In fact, our meeting rooms are named after our clients. So we're really invested in client relationship. Some of our clients are Boston University, National Geographic, okay, Patagonia. 
So the problem. We need to give content editors the ability to add logos without any developer intervention. Right? They, don't, they can't call on us every time they win a new client and they want to put it on the website or they want the ability to access that logo on the website. We need to change colors programmatically based on different modules and themes we have. So that was another really big issue and, and a big reason why we couldn't use raster images for this particular problem. We have to make the, re the solution reusable across multiple websites and we have about six of them we maintain. Okay, the real problem. We have Adobe as a client. We have to represent that logo in four different colors. We have to then do it in six different sizes for every Code42 customer. So that right there to me equals not going to happen. We're not going to save out a thousand different PNGs to represent these various clients against these various modules at various times. It's just not, it's not going to work. Um, so what we did is we built a plugin, uh, and that plugin allows us to upload SVGs, um, optimize them, and make them available globally for consumption of our modules. And I'm going to demo that for you right now. So this is what our plugin looks like. So as you can see, they need access to a lot of different logos. And they need to be represented in all the different colors. So we allow them to kind of look at the different themes and decide is this, you know, the way we want to portray our client on the website for this instance. Yeah, so it's just a nifty little plug-in, works really well. Um, but I mean, you can see how like crisp these logos are, right? They just look good. Let me see here. So obviously that's a custom plugin that you guys built for yourselves. It's not something available to the public. It's not available to the public, no. Um, if it was up to me, if I had my druthers, I would make a lot more of our stuff open source, but and you kind of know how that goes, so. Um. Okay, cool. So you're asking about how do we use this better accessibility? How do we make these SVGs accessible? And here we go right here. We have an SVG element, and we give it a ARIO label labeled by, and we equal that to title, and then we ID our title, with the same attribute that we fed to the ARIA, and there you go. Then you can define what it is, and the screen reader is gonna get to that element and say, oh, I know what to read here. It's what you told me to, because you referenced it here in this ARIA label. So as you can see, that, that works a lot better than an alt tag, right? Especially if I have an SVG like the Adobe one, that's like the red Adobe A, and then the word Adobe, right? I can separate those two things out and say, the screen reader read Adobe A and spell out the word Adobe if I want. So again, I mean, it's just pretty simple. It's not very complex to use this element. Would you add that time? I'm sorry? Would you add that time? Um, inherently, it's going to be hidden. You mean, is it going to show, is it going to render in the browser? No. Yeah. Animation effects. So SVG has this built-in animation element that, again, you can just link using IDs. And this animation element has things like move to, start from. So you can create an SVG element with an animation built into it, load it up to the browser, and it's good to go. No JavaScript, no CSS. So that's pretty powerful. Um, I prefer to use GreenSock, um, but again, how you would do that is just import GreenSock into your project, 
and call it out via ID. So you can do some pretty powerful stuff with green socks and tweens. So this to me is like one of the coolest features of SVG, this filter function, right? I've got an SVG and I want to do something different with it. Or maybe when I roll over it, I want it to blur. And when I roll off of it, I want it to unblur. Well, I can define that right here using, using this filter. And again, it's just simple. I feed it an ID and it knows what to do. Yeah? Can you use uh, SVG filters on raster graphics? You can. You can, yep. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really powerful. And I think there's 16 filters right now. Um, Sarah Sudan has a really, really good article on different filters and how to use them on uh, core drops. So I would, I would definitely check that out. Um, and this is pretty well supported as well. So unless you have to do something in IE 10. <laughs> well, you think that's funny, but when I was started, it was IE 5.5. <laughs> that was difficult. Um, like I said, it's just a really powerful, really cool feature. Um, and it can do things like this. Right, so that's just a little bit of um, JavaScript mixed with a SVG filter. SVG use. This is super cool. Um, if I define a SVG somewhere, I can reuse it elsewhere, again, without any more code or having the browser interpret any more code. It's going to load this. It's going to clone this element and load it in the shadow DOM. So in this example, we define one circle, and then we reuse it twice, but we gave it different um, styles. So. Really powerful as well. All right, the anatomy of an SVG. This is that scary part. Like all this element stuff on the top level, it's pretty cool, you know. It's pretty, I'm pretty used to it. And you don't really gotta get into the nitty gritty about what's going on past defining your styles and putting IDs on path and group, but we're just gonna walk through it. And uh, you know, it might get you out of a pinch when you hit an edge case at some point. So we have built-in elements. Um, those elements are rec, circle, polygon, line. Uh, this is what a rec looks like. So I have an SVG element, and um, I define a width and a height, and it gives me a rectangle. I can pass additional parameters, uh, rx, and that's going to curve the, um, the rectangle. We got circle, similar. You know, we, we feed it a radius and um, an X position and a Y position, and it just draws a circle for us right there. Polygon, this is powerful when you want to create um, an SVG element that basically starts where it stops. So this is a good example of that. Um, you know, wherever it starts, it's gonna stop. So, it, so this works well. Line. Um, this draws a line from a starting point to a finishing point, um, and then you can pass it. Um, yeah, it's basically just a starting point to a finishing point. That's what the X1, X2 is, and the Y1, Y2. Path. This is um, what you're going to see most often, and when you do that Illustrator conversion that I showed you, they normally create paths whenever they can. One thing I like to do with paths is group them based on color or animation preferences. But so you define a path and within the um, D you equal what that path is gonna look like. And the Z at the end closes the path. So you have to have the D equals, then you have to fill it in with the parameters and then you have to close it. Um, so uppercase is for absolute, uh, lowercase is for relative, um, M is for move to. 
Uh, L is for line, so you can define a bunch of lines in a path. Um, H is for horizontal. V is for vertical. And Z is to end the path. Um, so again, you know, because we have these paths, because we have these groups, we can actually make things responsive. You know, we can, based on the user's browser width, condense, remove elements from our SVG logo. And this is what that looks like in code, right? So I've wrapped it in a SVG called Disney logo. Um, I've named them appropriately, so Magic Castle, Walt, Disney, and then D. Um, and I, I group the things that I need multiple paths in. If you don't need multiple paths, you can not group them. I'd, I like to group everything, just so they're on the same hierarchy. And this is uh, an example of you know, what you could do with media queries and a responsive logo. So I think this is a lot better than what we currently have which, like I said, is just stretch, contain, cover. And this is how you do that with media queries. I mean, pretty basic stuff. You guys have done media queries if you've done any type of responsive development, and you just call it out the same way you would call out any CSS class in your markup. OK. Um, what else is cool about paths is you can add uh, Beziers to them. So we have C, that's a cubic Bezier, self-reflecting cubic Bezier. That's kind of if you wanted to make like an S shape, right? It's going to give, it's going to get where the line curves, it's going to give a reflected, similar but opposite curve to it. Uh, quadratic Bezier. Uh, elliptical arch. And this is a really fun, cool tool. Um, it's basically, you can go in here and play with these different things on a path, and then it will tell you exactly what uh, Bezier code you need to achieve that, um, which is really powerful and cool. Hmm. View box. Um, this is what you wrap your inner elements for your SVG in. And you can define a width and height. I tend to take out the width and height because most of the time I want my SVGs to be responsive. Um, but view box is basically, you can think of it as cropping the canvas in which your SVG is going to live. Right? So it's going to need to be the width and height that you want it to be to display all your elements. Um, Preserve aspect ratio. Uh, the default is going to be X mid, Y mid. That's smack dab in the center of that view box that we just talked about. Um, these are the options. X has mid, 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 and max. Y, the same thing. Mid, mid, and max. Uh, meet slice or none. You can think of that as cropping. Slice is going to crop the SVG elements if they're larger than the viewport. Meet is going to confine them to the viewport. This is kind of an uh, image that represents that. So, and then this is an image that's going to represent the difference between um, slicing and not slicing. Um, this is a cool example of um, using responsive uh, text. So it just kind of keeps its, keeps its weight on the page no matter how wide or narrow you have the page with. This clicker doesn't want to work. Um, this is a list of resources. Well, I don't know. Uh, 
Um, so Sarah Drasner and um, the two Sarahs, they, um, they are kind of the oracles of the SVG landscape. They have a ton of stuff about um, animating SVGs, filtering SVGs, and they've kind of been singing SVG praise for years now. Um, so I would, I would definitely suggest following them. And I'm going to open it up for questions. Yeah. So I'm a designer, not a developer. So going back to like the Disney logo and how you set up the variations on, you know, this is the responsive mark, how I want that to go from horizontal to stack to down to like a single B. Yep. Will I just basically give the vari the variations that I want to my developer and then he'll simply kind of animate between one, like larger to smaller? Or how do you how do you determine what that um, yeah, I mean, I think you would kind of treat it, you'd kind of treat it just like you would any layout, like, you know, if you're going to do mobile first, if it's here, then show them what that looks like and that width. But in the actual Illustrator, you're going to want to group those things and name them appropriately. That way you and your de developer can have a conversation and say, hey, on group Walt Disney or on group Magic Castle, I want that to disappear on, um, you know, on iPads or something like that. Yep. 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 Selectable and copy and pasteable. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm assuming there's a way. I'm thinking there's probably some type of element or trick you could do to get that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, so the SMIL animation was that animation tag that I, sh that I showed earlier. Um, that, I think that's adopted from that spec. Okay. And I, okay, go ahead. There's like translational, rotational, you know, scaling animation, mm -hmm. which is of course supporting CSS. Right. But when we're talking about animating points on a graphic and doing things that are more interactive, it seems like Canvas has been the way to go with that. But I was wondering if you have any ways to do it with SVG that were still supported by modern browsers. Um, you know, I, th I think you can get pretty far with that animate element and CSS, but, you know, I mean, sometimes just, you know, basic CSS and HTML won't get the job done. Do you have, like, a specific use case that you're thinking of? Um, yeah. Okay. So, what's a good software for, for creating animations with SVG files? Um, um, so you're asking if if I have like um, a software and I want to create an SVG animation, Correct, yeah. and I just want I just want to be able to do it in the software and then export it. Yeah. I think Adobe has a product that's pretty good for that. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Uh, I'm more on the development side though, so I I wouldn't I, w I really wouldn't know. Is there any designers in the room that are aware? Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a free SVG animator. Well, I'm sorry? Yeah, Inkscape. Yep. It's called Inkscape. It's, um, it's a free SVG editor. Um, I, I find it kind of hard to use, but maybe that's just me. If you use the Illustrator, Adobe does everything completely differently on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're locked in then. Do you have any tips for good tracing in Illustrator? Because that's frustrating. Especially. Yeah. Um, so tip number one, I'd say get a large transparent image. And then kind of, okay, so when I, actually, 
Um, I could show you guys that. So there's more features of Illustrator. But in that trace feature, you can do a custom trace. Oops. Whoa. Oh, sorry, computer died. <laughs> um, but in that, in that trace, there's, if you go all the way down to the bottom of the dropdown, there's a custom trace feature, and then you can kind of play with the different nuances of it just to get it just right. Right. Because the points come from after you expand. Right. And then you can tweak those yourself. But just as far as like getting into, I don't know, I just get frustrated because a lot of times it just doesn't trace accurately or clearly. Yep, yep. Why not? Like yep, and that, like I said, that's that, that setting when you yeah. pick like two colors, three colors, 16 colors, or if you do a custom, right. you just kind of got to play with it yeah. and start with a large image. It'll put as many points on it as you want, but eventually it gets to where it just spit up this monster. Right. 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 What are. I also have to recommend when, before you try to trace anything, bring it into Photoshop and clean it up there, yeah. and then also really increase the contrast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's good tip, yeah. Yep. Posterize it too. Okay, yeah. Um, I prefer grouping, I guess. I don't, I don't know if there's a compelling reason. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So if I have multiple paths and I know that they're going to be the same color, then yeah, you should compound them. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so you you have a okay, so you have a, you have a problem in where the editor wants to grab an SVG from a list of SVGs and then have it inline on the page. Yeah, from like our uh, media files, like grab an SVG and have it be inline. Right. For yeah. Um, so you could, well, if you want it to be inline, you could use that plugin, and they have an inline option and allow you to select from the media query. What we did is we created a custom post type, and that post type has a reference to the file that we're gonna get the content from, and then they pick which logo they wanna use from a dropdown list, and uh, on the, in the template, we parse that. So it knows what to grab when. Right. It's really the best way for a website to serve logos specifically is as Inline SVG if you do it right. It's gonna come out crisp no matter what. Yeah. Order. Right. Right. Yep. And and you get all that control. And a small enough file size that it's. Well, I'm, right. I mean, it, you don't even have to use a file if it's inline. It's just it's just rendering HTML at that point. So. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. Thank you.